We do welcome each one to our Bible study and our prayer meeting tonight. It's wonderful to see you out in the house of God, and it's great to be able to fellowship once again with God's people. And we do pray the Lord will meet with us tonight in a very special way. We welcome those who are watching online as well, and pray the Lord will meet with you where you're at, and that we will know deep sense of his presence and power in prayer, even as we seek to petition the throne of grace uh, tonight. We want to sing our opening hymn. It will be on the screens, and it is, I will sing of my Redeemer. We'll remain seated uh, as we sing this hymn together.
We'd ask you to stand, please, as we come to the throne of grace in prayer and ask for God's blessing tonight upon our gathering. Our gracious Lord and our loving, eternal, heavenly Father, we thank thee for the theme of the song that we have just been singing. It's in the name of our Saviour that we come to thy throne tonight. We come pleading his merit. We come robed in his righteousness. And we thank you. We can truly say that on the cross he purchased my redemption shed his blood, and made me free. We thank thee, Lord. We come before thee as our Heavenly Father, and we bow and we acknowledge that all we have and all we are is because of Christ. And we thank thee, Lord, for that salvation. We thank thee for the day and hour in our lives whenever thou didst reach down and pluck us from the depths of our sin. Lord, we are a blessed people tonight, and our hearts overflow as we think of how uh, privileged we are, Lord, chosen and called and saved and Lord thou art with us with that promise you will never leave us nor forsake us and we just thank thee Lord for our salvation and everything that it means for us tonight we thank you Lord for the opportunity to gather once again in the house of God and we do pray Lord that you'll be pleased in future days to remove all the restrictions that there are but we thank thee Lord for the opportunity to be here tonight and to hear even all our voices singing and to hear and see our brothers and sisters in Christ so often, Lord, in the years gone by, we took it for granted, but we thank you for the privilege of being here tonight. And it is a privilege to enter into thy house. And we pray, Lord, that you'll help us to ever count this a very high privilege in our minds and to think highly of the house of God and to come when the doors are open and to worship thee. We do pray you'll bless this word to our hearts tonight. May it be a word in season, a word for each soul tonight. Encourage us, we pray. Speak to our hearts, and then as we come to our time of prayer, all oh, pour out thy spirit, we pray. Oh, we would say with the hymn writer, showers of blessing, we need them. Showers of blessing from thee. Oh, Lord, we pray you'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out these blessings upon us that there will not be room to receive it. Bless us now, we pray, and give us joy, even as we hear thy precious word. In Jesus' precious and holy name we ask it. Amen. And amen. We're turning to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. And if you turn over there, we're going to verse number 97. If you've been following on these past number of weeks, we've been doing a series on the Bible, God's precious book. And that first week we talked about the Bible delivered and how the Lord spoke and how that was given to the different prophets and apostles. Uh, the second week we thought about the Bible denounced and how that the devil attacked the Bible from the very beginning. As God's word was given, the devil attacked it and is still doing so today. And then on our third week, we talked about the Bible declared and how it came into our language and how thankful we are for those who gave their lives that we would have the freedom. And then for this week, uh, or for last week and this week and for a few weeks in the future in the will of the Lord, we're going to think about the Bible described and how the Bible describes itself to allow us to know more of what it is. Last week, we thought about the hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces and what a wonderful thing it was that the Lord can take his word and do mighty things, change our lives completely. Tonight, we're thinking about the Bible as the lamp and the light. And this is where we get it from, uh, Psalm 119. I'm sure you know the Psalm 119 is an acrostic and every uh, it goes in eight verses so the first eight verses are the first Hebrew letter Aleph and all the verses begin with that letter and then the second eight verses uh, the next Hebrew letter the letter Beth and all the words or the, all the verses begin with that so we are coming to this section and it starts in verse number 97 oh how I love thy law it is my meditation all the day. Thou through thy commandments has made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. I have not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Amen. A few thoughts about this passage that we're looking at tonight, and it's her text, is verse 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet 
and a light onto my path. Whenever we read of light in the scripture, we always must remember that true light comes from God. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 3, in the midst of the darkness, God said, let there be light and there was light. And that physical light was created in the sun being placed in the sky. Uh, The days and the night seasons were created. And because of that, we are able to live and exist in this world. Without light, mankind cannot exist. The crops would not be able to grow among many other implications. We need light to be alive. And the Bible tells us that God is the source of light. Now, we're talking about physical light, of course. But he's also the giver, not only of physical life, as light, sorry, as revealed in Matthew 5, verse 45. He maketh his son to rise on the evil and the good and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. So physical light comes from the Lord. So those who say, well, I don't need the Lord, or I don't believe in the Lord, or I can do without the Lord. If the Lord took his light away, then there would be no life upon uh, this earth. And the Lord Jesus Christ not only gives physical light, but of course, he is a source of all spiritual light. In fact, he is referred to as light in both the Old and the New Testaments. He declares it himself in John chapter 8, verse 12. I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Now, the second thing I want to think about this aspect of light is the light of the world. The Lord Jesus Christ uses other lights in this world for his glory and for his testimony. Now, we know that all spiritual light is from the Lord. And these examples that I give to you, the light that is shining forth is the light that the Lord has given So, for example, the Christian has a spiritual light. It says in Matthew 5, 17, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So as we are shining our light, what is that? It's obedience to the Lord. And whatever way we reflect his glory or declare his glory, the source of the light is Christ. But we reflect it or declare it in our lives. So not only is a Christian to be a light in this world, but the church is to be a light in this world. In Philippians chapter 4, it says, do all things without, or sorry, Philippians chapter 2, verse 14, do all things without murmuring and disputing, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. Now, Paul is saying that the church at Philippi were there to shine as a light in this world by their obedience to the Lord and in holding forth the word of life, the word of God, the book of God. And through that, we receive information, instruction from the Lord as how we live a right to shine before men. So the Christian is a light in this world. The church is a light in this world. But specifically what we want to look at tonight is the Bible, because thy word, thy scripture, thy law is a lamp unto my feet and a light onto my path. Now, what I want to look at, first of all, is the fact that light gives illumination. So the Bible illuminates. It shows us what is around us. Now, there are two different words used here. The word lamp is used, first of all. Now, the word lamp here in Hebrew, it means to glisten. It's the idea of a candle or a small oil lamp. And if you have seen one, it would fit in the palm of your hand, just about that size, with a little wick. And when it's lit, it gives light. And that's what the people would have used in the times that the scriptures were written. This little lamp to give a little light that would shine forth just a little bit in front of you. For example, it would be like you lighting a candle when there's a power cut. And you know that it gives enough light for you to see where you're at and to see around you. But it doesn't give you enough light to see far off into the distance. And as we think of that, there's also another type of light mentioned here. So the lamp is like a glistening candle or a little oil lamp that shows a little distance ahead. But the word light there, which is used in the second part of the verse, a light onto my path, that's a different type of light. In the Hebrew, that means a bright, clear light like morning. And if you have ever been up to see the sunrise, you will know that all of a sudden the sun comes up and you can see clearly. You can see into the distance. So the Bible is used in both of these ways. 
to see a little bit ahead, but to also see clearly all around you. So how can we apply that? Well, whenever we think of the lamp or the candle, how we can see just a little bit ahead, I believe that means it's sufficient to show us that the next step we have to take. What is the next step that we have to take as we journey? You know, we don't know much about future days. We don't know uh, what we will be doing this time next week, if we'll be alive next week. The Lord often leads us one step at a time. And you'll find that when the Lord shows you a command and you take that step, then he'll show you another command for the next step and then another command for the next step. So we obey uh, obediently and willingly and then the Lord shows us the next step. So I believe when it talks about the lamp onto my feet, it's talking to each Christian about the fact that this book talks about God's specific will for your life. And how he wants you to live. And he will guide you in that way. And then when we think about the light in the second part of the verse. And how it shows all clearly all around. And you can look over the fields. And you look down the road. And see. Well that is sufficient light. To show us the realities of this world. To show us truth and error. To show us the path of righteousness as revealed in scripture. You see in this scripture we have a great light. And it shows us this world as it truly is. It shows us reality. It shows us the path we are walking on. It shows us the world that we are walking through. Now in the dark we may try and imagine the obstacles and the realities around us but when the light comes on then it is very clear and therefore when we come to the scripture we don't have to guess how to travel. We don't have to guess if the world is good or bad for the Christian. We don't have to guess these things. We can see clearly with this particular light. God gives us vision through his word. And therefore, we need to pray that every time we open the word of God, that the Holy Spirit shows us and shines that light, as it were, upon his word. In Proverbs 6, verse 23, we read this sentence, For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and the reproofs of instruction are the way of life. The commandment is a lamp and the law is light. So whenever you come to it, you can see clearly God's standards for right and for wrong. What God expects of us and what God wants us to do. Now, whenever we think about the fact that the Bible illuminates and it shows clearly how things truly are, this explains the unrepentant sinner's reaction to the Bible. And often their reaction is to the Bible, I don't want to hear it. I'm not interested in that. No, I'm not religious at all. They don't want to see the light. And why would a person not want to see the light? Why would they not want to see truth? Why would they not want to see the world for what it really is? Because it's in complete contrast to their view of what is right and wrong. It's in complete contrast to their nature. You see, the scripture exposes sinners as sinners. And therefore, that isn't pleasing to the flesh. So the sinner doesn't want to hear the scripture and is content to go on in their own thoughts and in their own ways. Listen to what the word of God says in John's gospel, chapter three, verse number 18. And the Lord Jesus Christ spoke about this. He told Nicodemus about this. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. And this is the condemnation. That light is come into the world. We have the Lord is the light and we have the word is the light. Light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God." So the fact that there is a light and that this does show us clearly who we truly are and what the world truly is and what God's standards truly are, the fact that we have this explains why the sinner often reacts in the way they do to the Bible. But it also explains why the Bible brings great blessing to those who use it. And there are three simple thoughts I want to leave with you tonight in this study about the light of Scripture. So because it illuminates, it gives revelation. This lamp and light reveals truth to us from God. 
the message that God wants the world to know. It's his message. That's why the preacher is called the servant of God, because he doesn't have a message of his own to bring. He's simply a messenger on behalf of the Lord, going to the people whom God has called him to preach to say, this is what the Lord has said. And he goes to this word. He goes to this book. Now, in the darkness of sin and in the darkness of this world, there's a very warped understanding of what the purpose of man is. Why are we here? What's the point of my existence? And you can go into a bookstore today and you can lift multitudes of books with all different aspects of this is the purpose of living. Follow this direction to give you satisfaction. And yet none of them will point you to scripture. God's word tells us why we were created. We were created to have fellowship with God. The chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. The Bible clearly reveals to us what man's duty is toward God, to his creator, and not only to our creator, but also to our fellow creatures, to those who we live among. The Bible tells us how to interact with those among whom we live. It also reveals the sinfulness of sin. You know, if we didn't have the scriptures, man could convince himself that sin is good. In fact, we see it in the world today. But whenever we come to the word of God with an open heart, we realize that sin is exceedingly sinful. It also teaches us of the righteousness God requires of us. And as we see that righteousness and that perfect standard, we are reminded that we are not able to please God and of ourselves. We will never be in heaven because of our efforts, but only because of the work of Christ. Not our righteousness, but that of another. And this light presents us with a wonderful saviour. In the midst of sin's darkness and despair, we can shine forth the light of the word of God, the light of the gospel. And this revelation, this book, this teaching has been used of God throughout the centuries to bring countless men and women, boys and girls to the Savior and to strengthen them in their walk with the Lord. Someone summarized the Bible like this. This word and the gospel that it contains is a great and glorious light by which men have come to know the knowledge of God and Christ, because God is gracious and merciful. They have come to know of Christ and his person, his offices, his grace, of righteousness, of salvation, of eternal life through Christ. It teaches them to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this world. And that's what the Bible does. And therefore, if we come as Christians to the word of God, into the light to see what is right and wrong, we will be shown clearly, and it will be revealed to us the way in which we ought to live. It reveals what God wants us to know. It reveals his will and his promises to us. And that's why when we read the book, we ought to read it carefully. And we ought to read it remembering that the words that are written there are words that God wants to you, you to know. He's speaking to you. Whether it's in church, whether it's at home, whether it's listening to the Bible being read or whatever it is, God is speaking to you. So that's the first thing. The light gives Revelation. Secondly, the light gives safety and discernment because it shines. Now, if you try to walk in the dark, and when I say dark, I mean the pitch dark where there is no light, where there's an absence of light. When you try to walk or to work in the dark, it's dangerous. Complete darkness hides all the dangers. And as a result, there's accidents and there's trips and there's falls and there's injuries. Even in your own home. Maybe you feel that you know your home very well, but as you try to maneuver from one place to the other in the dark, maybe at the night time, not wanting to wake someone else, the darkness causes us to be confused and you bang into something or you feel you're somewhere and you don't realize where you were. But one of the things that the Bible does for the Christian is in shining forth its light, it shows us the dangers that are around us, that we may avoid them or deal with them appropriately. Some of the dangers it shows to us, it shows us false doctrine. So the light shines, and whenever God's word shines forth, it exposes false doctrine because it's not in this book. In fact, this book speaks against it. It shows stumbling blocks. It shows ditches and pits that we can fall into. It shows error. It shows dangerous activities exposed for what they really are, destructive and damaging. And therefore, God's word exposes and shines a light upon all of these different things. That's why we need to walk within the light of the word of God. When there's something given by God and used by God, then the devil will have a counterfeit. 
So we need to know truth that we will not be confused. And one of the great dangers in today's society is that some people don't believe that this Bible is enough. And therefore you'll get people saying things like this, well, the Lord told me, and the Lord told me this, and I'm bringing you this message that the Lord told me, but it's a message that's beyond what Scripture teaches. It's a message that really has no warrant in Scripture because it's not there. And that's very dangerous. It sounds very spiritual, doesn't it? Wow, that person must be really in touch with God because the Lord is speaking to him. But I'll tell you, if the message that he has received is a message that goes contrary to the teachings of Scripture, it isn't the Lord speaking to him. And that's a fearful thing. You see, we do not need to have some extra revelation. We don't need to have more scripture, as it were, than we have already. We don't need a preacher coming along saying, but this is what scripture says, but God has told me something else for now. This is right for now. No, the Bible's for now. The Bible is enough for now. And how do I know that? Well, I'm going to give you three verses and you maybe jot down them, uh, just the references, because these are, teach us that God's word is sufficient. God's word is sufficient for all we need. We don't need extra uh, scriptural uh, revelation. There is going to be none. There's an amen at the end of this book. God has given all that we need for salvation, for sanctification, and to take us home. The first one is John chapter 20, verse 31. But these things are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. This book that God has given is enough for you to be saved. We don't need extra words. We don't need extra uh, revelations because God's word says these things are written that ye might believe. And therefore God has given all that we need. Secondly, 1 John 5 and 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know ye have eternal life and that ye may believe in the name of the Son of God. So not only do we have salvation through the word of God, but we have assurance. We have assurance Maybe there's someone in this meeting tonight. Maybe there's someone watching online and you have been struggling with assurance and you've been running to bookshelves and reading commentaries or you've been reading books by different men and good books. There's nothing wrong with the books, but it's through God's word you will have assurance because we believe that what God says is true. What is my assurance? My assurance is this, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved and that I called And therefore, Christ has saved me. My assurance is this, he that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Well, I came to the Lord with repentance and faith, so he can never cast me out. That's my assurance. My assurance is in the promises of God. So I don't need extra revelation to be assured of who I am in Christ. But I know, I know I have eternal life because the Bible tells me so. So salvation in John 20, 31 Assurance in 1 John 5 and 13. And then the third verse is John chapter 15, verse number 11. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. And the words that the Lord has given us in this book are enough for our joy. And sometimes a Christian thinks, well, I know I'm saved, and I have to read my Bible, and I have to go to church, but if I really want to live, I have to do other things and go elsewhere. This book ought to be your joy. How sweet, the psalmist said in verse 103, are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. He understood how precious the word of God was and what great joy there is whenever we come to the word and say, Lord, speak to me. And he reveals unto us the dangers and the pitfalls of society. And praise God for that. Any person who's any new revelation from God is speaking against scripture and that's heresy. So we do not receive that. But we receive this book because this is the word of God. And then finally, not only does it give revelation, not only does it give safety and discernment, but it also gives testimony. Someone once said, the whole scripture is a light shining in a dark place, a lamp or a torch to be carried in the hand of the believer while he passes through this dark world. And not only does the word of God shine forth when it is preached, but it shines forth when it is lived. And when you are living in the light of the word in obedience to the word, then you have a bright testimony in this dark world. 
This will be clear. It will be effective. It will be authentic. And that's what people are looking out for today. Is he authentic? Is she authentic? Are they the real deal? And friend, that will only be seen by the life that you live. And that's what we need today. Bible-believing Christians, but Bible-obeying Christians. And sadly today, some Christians think, well, that, I know the Bible says that, and, but I don't, I, don't, I don't hold to that. Maybe they don't say it publicly, but they say it with their lives. But what a testimony of a Bible-believing, Bible-obeying Christian. And as I come to this light, I think, like everyone else, we feel that we failed so many times to shine forth the light from our lives, from my life. And therefore, may the Lord give us grace to do so. May the Lord give us grace to live a life that radiates with Christ. Now, that's not put on. That's not acting in a certain way. That is simply obeying the word of God. You may never stand in a pulpit. You may never have an audience or a class to speak to. But I'll tell you, if you are obeying the word of God, you will have a wonderful impact among those with whom you live, with whom you work, with whom you go to school. And may God give us that. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. How do I live? I come to the word of God and find out. What is God's plan for my life? I come to the word of God and find out. Isn't it wonderful in the darkness of this world, the wickedness of this world? We come to the word of God and wow, it's so clear. The light shines and explains what's right and wrong. Let's often be in this book, walking in the light of the word of God. Amen. Let's pray. We're going to unite our hearts together. And we thank you for coming tonight. We do encourage you to pray. We do ask you to take part tonight. Uh, just to remind you that we're in a, a big, bigger building.